Hot air. I like it when you go to those places where they have those hot air things to dry your hands. You press the silver button, the machine starts roaring, and hot air rushes out of a silver spout. You hold your hands under it, and the water just dries off your hand. Some of them, you can turn the spout and make it blow your hair about. If you turn the spout round, when your friends come in, they go to dry their hands, and the hot air goes whoosh into their face. Whoosh! Warms your nose up, that does. Horrible. I was starving. All I had for breakfast was one apple and 15 raisins. It was half past 12 and I had to get to Hamel Hempstead. So I bought a pizza and I ran and ran and jumped on my train. As we pulled out of Euston Station, I began to eat. Trouble was, my pizza was in a paper bag. One sloppy, cheesy pizza with the melting cheese and tomato stuck to the bag. So I peeled off the paper, off my pizza, but it was slippery and sticky, and the pizza came off in soggy lumps that I scooped together and pushed into my mouth, and hmm, blob by blob. But then there were dollops of pizza hiding in the corner of the bag, so I was holding the bag up to my face, tipping it into my mouth. Hmm, hmm, oh. I was drinking pizza, and my fingers were running with dribbles of tomato, and Oh, and slops of spicy cheese all over my knuckles. So there I was, uh, licking at my skin, but my fingers were trailing all over my chin. So off went my tongue round my face, uh, uh, hunting for drips of pizza. But a bit of paper bag had got into my mouth, so I was in there trying to get it out with the finger I was licking. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was diving into the slobber in my mouth, and I was snuffling with my nose, like I was breathing in pizza. It was then... I noticed the woman opposite. She was watching me. She looked like she had never seen anything quite so horrible in all her life. Shram and Sheddle. There's an old shop in Islington called Shram and Sheddle. Today it's a shop that sells preposterous presents. I imagine that a long time ago it was a tailor's shop. And it went like this. Mr. Shram was the boss. Mr. Sheddle sat at the sewing machine with his foot on the pedal, sewing away. Sometimes Mr. Shram thought Mr. Sheddle wasn't working hard enough, so he shouted, Pedal, Sheddle! And Sheddle snarled back, Scram, Shram! And so it went on, day after day. Pedal, sheddle, scram, shram. Pedal, sheddle, scram, shram. Pedal, sheddle, scram, shram. Daddy Longlegs in a hotel room. Everyone's ducking out of the way of you and your furry legs. You are like eyelashes with wings, fluttering and flittering about, bumping into lampshades, ta-ta, 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 a jerky drum solo. You feel like a spider's web when you brush across our faces, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Kill it, Dad! Kill it, Dad! They think your hairs could bite and sting. We stare at your up the wall, down the wall, dancing. If we're not careful, you could jitterbug down our necks. Tutter, tutter, ta 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 ta. I switch out the light. It's quiet. We lie and wonder if there'll be a moment when we'll feel your whiskers. Whisper across our skin. Ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. In the morning, the bathroom is white and glary. You're flat out on the tiles, your legs splayed. The jazz is over. It would be great if you subscribed, that is, become a subscriber. That way, you get to see when I post up new vids. Losing things. 
I hate losing things. So I think, what if there's a place somewhere where everything you ever lost goes? Somehow or other, all those things you ever lost found their way there, to this place. Maybe there's a huge hall somewhere with hundreds and hundreds of doors. And one of the doors has got your name on it. I see myself going to this huge hall one day. The way in is not very big, but once you get inside, it's enormous. It's cold and dark and damp, and there are thousands of people there, and they're all looking for the door that belongs to them, the door with their name on it. Everyone is asking everyone else, hey, have you seen my door? <laughs> What's your name? And people are saying things like, yeah, no, no, I think I saw it over there, or ah, don't bother me, I'm looking for mine. So I begin to look and I walk about and I ask someone, uh, excuse me, have you seen my door? Yeah, I think it's over there, she says. So I go over there, but it isn't. So I go on wandering around the big hall. I ask someone, excuse me, have you seen my door? And someone says, yeah, um, up the spiral stair, it's on the second floor. On the way there, someone stops and says, have you seen my door? And I say, no, I haven't, sorry. I climb the spiral stair onto the second floor, but my door isn't there either. So I go on, wandering around the big hall. And someone comes up to me and says, have you seen my door? Have you seen mine, I say. Yeah, it's at the end, by the steel doors. And it is. It's my door. It's got my name on it. I knock on the door. Who's there? Me. We were expecting you. The bolts draw back. The door opens and two old people let me in and shut the door behind me. It's all here, one of them says. It's all here, the other one says. And they're right. There's my pen knife from Switzerland that I lost when I was 12. <laughs> the old watch. I lost in my car accident. My blue anorak with the hood that I left on a railway station in Paris. Yeah, my round gold sunglasses that I once wore in a play to make me look as if I was blind. The football. That was a birthday present that I lost on the same day I got it over a wall in the burnt out church. They're all there. Yeah. A black and white and green towel. A Moroccan leather wallet. They're all says one of the old people. They're all here, says the other. Have you got a bag to take them away in, says one. Here's a bag to take them away in, says the other. So I fill up the bag with all the things that I've ever lost until the shelves are empty. Come back and see us any time, says one. Come back and see us, says the other. You know where we are now, don't you? says one. You know where we are, says the other. And they shut the door. I hear the locks and bolts on the door. And I walk away into the crowd, into the huge hall. And everyone is still walking around, asking everyone else, do you know where my door is? A tall man with the steering wheel in his hand says to me, you seen my door, have you? No, I say, no. No, I don't expect you have. He says, I look round to see if I can remember where my door was. It's out of sight. Too many people are in the way. So I say to myself, one day I'll try and find my way back there. But something tells me, some little voice in my head says, I bet you'll never ever find that door again. You've had the only chance you'll ever have. So I make my way out of that huge dark hall with the thousands and thousands of doors and the thousands and thousands of people and I hurry home with my bag and I get back to my room and I spread out on the floor all those things that I'd lost and I've now got back again. And that makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah! The Child Who Was Wild 
Once there was a woman, a young, young woman. She ran from the city, the old, old city. She ran to the woods, the deep, dark woods. She wasn't seen for days, many, many days. She came out of the woods, the deep, dark woods. She came with a child, a child who was wild. She brought the child to the city, the old, old city. He grew and he grew. He grew and he grew. His hands grew shoots, green shoots and leaves. His shoulders grew flowers, the lily and the rose. His hair was the blossom that blows in the wind. He stood in the city, the old, old city, with the leaves, the flowers and the blossom falling, falling, falling on grey, grey gravel. I'm not going places with them again. When we went to Chessington Zoo with the club, we all went in and the leader said, Right, listen everyone, listen everyone, everyone listen. You can all go off where you like for the next two hours and we'll all meet up here at four o'clock at four o'clock okay then we all went off where we liked i saw the lions and the seals and the parrots and the giraffes and the crocodiles <laughs> i ate my cheese and pickle sandwiches a packet of crisps and drank some of my fizzy orange and ate a chocolate swiss roll then i asked someone the time and she said four o'clock so i went back to where we had to meet when i got there Everyone started shouting at me. Where have you been? Hmm? Where do you think you've been? We've been looking for you for hours. We couldn't find you anywhere. We've scarcely had a chance to see any of the animals. Where have you been? I looked at them and I said, Well, I've been walking around the zoo. I'm on time, aren't I? So then they started shouting at me again. You weren't supposed to wander off on your own, were you? You were supposed to be in your group. Everyone else was in their groups. You weren't, were you? No. Well, we've got to go now. Just think, you've spoilt everyone's afternoon now. I listened to all that, but I wasn't sorry. They said, you can all go off now. They didn't say anything about groups. What groups? I'm not going places with them again. Wrong. We went on holiday with Mr. Wrong. Everything we said, he said, was wrong. He asked us if night came before day or day before night. We said that day came before night. He said, wrong. So we said, night came before day. And he said, wrong. He asked us which came first, Sunday or Monday. We said, Sunday. And he said, wrong. So we said, Monday. And he said, wrong. He asked us if he was telling fibs. We said, yes. He said, wrong. He asked us if he was telling the truth. We said, yes. And he said, wrong. Then we asked him, why are you asking us all these questions? He said it was because we liked it. And we said, wrong. In. In the city, running, running, even at night, in the city, a street, in the street, a block of flats, empty, empty but for one flat, in that flat, one room, one room, lit up, in that room, one person, in that person, a heart, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. The seagulls. The seagulls think we live at the seaside. The tower blocks are their cliffs. They swoop for fish in the gutter, but are happy that it's last night's fried rice. They stand about, screaming on the pavement beach, and ride the sea breezes, pumped out by the cinema air conditioning. They hover over the waves of cars, 
And if you stare at them, wondering what they're doing so far from home, they stare back. This is our home now. That kebab is a crab. Rawr! Rawr! Acorn, Conquer and Key Hey, Acorn, who do you think you are? A hard guy? You look like a little hard-boiled egg sitting in a cup. Well, I'm telling you, hard guy, a squirrel is going to find you. And if he doesn't eat you, he's going to bury you. Just because you're the start-out point for the tree that made the first ships to go right round the world, that doesn't mean you're a big shot. You're no circumnavigator. And you, conquer. Always up for a fight, aren't you? Let me get at him, let me get at him, that's you. <laughs> well, I know your little secret. There you are, lying about in your little greenhouse, and then, when the walls split, out you pop, like you think you're some shiny new car cruising out of the garage. But I've seen inside your little greenhouse. You lie there for weeks, all tucked up in a soft white bed, don't you? <laughs> Hard man. <laughs> but you, Sycamore Key, you're plain weird, just plain weird. You jive about in the air, jiving in the wind. Cool moves, man. But then you lie on the ground in a heap with all the other jivers looking like a dead moth. There's hundreds of you. Dead moths lying there. You're weird. Where are you at? Arrows. Me and my friend Harry Bow, we were playing arrows. You take the grass that's got pointed tops. You pull one off and you pew, throw it. It can glide through the air. And if it lands on something soft, it can stick in, in something like a jumper or your hair. We love playing arrows. We found this open window on the wall of the alley by my house. We stood back from the window to see who could get an arrow through the window. First it was his turn, then mine. Pew! 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 Mostly they missed. Then, pew, one went in. Yeah, arrow, we shouted. Then we carried on. Pew, pew, missing again and again. <laughs> All of a sudden, a man appeared in the alley. It was the man we called Baldy. He came marching up and stood there in front of us. He holds out his hand. He looked down at it. What do you think this is, eh? He shouted. We looked down. There, stuck between his fingers, was an arrow. He told us to clear off, and we did. Later, when we sat down round at Harry Bow's place, we talked about how the arrow must have gone whizzing through the window and landed on his hand. And we imagined him sitting there and an arrow coming from nowhere, just happening to land on his hand. Wow! What a shot! And we laughed and laughed. Then, much later, Haribo said, I wonder whose arrow it was? Yours or mine? And neither of us knew. And neither of us will ever know. The go-kart. Me and my mate Haribo, we once made a go-kart. Everyone was making go-karts, so we had to make one. Big Tony's was terrific. Big Tony was terrific, because Big Tony told us he was. What he said was, I am terrific. And because Big Tony was very big, no one said, uh, Big Tony, you're not terrific. So, Big Tony was terrific, and Big Tony's go-kart was terrific, and that was that. When Big Tony sat on his go-kart, he looked like a real driver. He had control. When he came down a road round our way called Moss Lane, he could make the wind blow in his hair. 
he can make the wheels of his go-kart go. And he went, as he went past. I was jealous of Big Tony. I was afraid that I thought he might be terrific. So me and Haribo, we made a go-kart out of his old pram and some boxes and crates we got from the off-license. We nailed it up with bent nails, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should use big metal staples. And he gave us some. He said they were heavy duty. Heavy duty? Wow, that sounded terrific. So then we tied cord round the front cross piece, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should use the pram handle. And he helped us fix the pram handle to the cross piece. He said, that'll give you control. Control. Wow, that sounded terrific. Haribo sat on the beer crate and steered. I kneeled behind, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should kneel on foam pads. And he cut these two foam pads for me to kneel on. Haribo's dad said, that will help you last the course. Last the course. Wow, that sounded terrific. Our go-kart was ready. So we took it up to the top of Moss Lane and Haribo said, I'll steer, and he did. It was fantastic. It felt just like Big Tony looked, the hair in the wind, the wheels. So we both went. So we took it up the top of Moss Lane again and Haribo said, I'll steer, and he did. It was Amazing. The road went blurry, the hair in the wind. The wheels went. So we both went. So we took it up the top of Moss Lane again, and Harry Bow said, I'll steer. So I said, Can I have a go? Harry Bow said, No. Oh, go on, I said. No, he said, you've never done it before. Oh, go on, Harry Bo, let me have a go. Go on, I mean. Blimey, come on, Harry Bo. Go on. No. Oh, go on, oh, go on, I mean, go, go on. All right, he said. Now look out, won't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I said. I thought, I am going to be terrific. My hair. Whew. My wheels, me, and away we went. Hair, yeah, the wheels, yeah, me, yeah, but halfway down Moss Lane, there's Moss Close, and that's where the road curves, and that's where Big Tony steers, Big Tony leans, Big Tony controls. I saw Moss Close coming up really fast. Steer, shouts Harry Bow. Steer, you big wally. And I yanked the pram handle. Ugh. And the whole world went round once and twice and three times. And my head went rolling down the road, pulling me after it. And then the go-kart came for the ride over and over and over until my nose and my chin and my two front teeth landed up in the grit of the gutter. Haribo was crying. <laughs> I breathed in and it kind of whistled. <whistles> there it was again. I stuck my finger up to my tooth and it was chipped. Haribo said, your chin's bleeding. And I said, yeah, your chin's bleeding. And oh, no, he said. We walked home. He pulled the cart, got to his place. He didn't say anything. Nothing at all, not a word. And he went in. I walked onto my place. It was still whistling. When I got in, I told mum everything and she said, well, she said all kinds of things like, well, your teeth will probably fall out, you know? One of those nice things that mum sometimes say. Next day at school, they were all asking about the crash. They all looked at my tooth and then they wanted to see the go-kart. Harry Bow said, you can't, because my dad's chopped it up. 
chopped up. Wow, that sounded terrible. Hey, when Haribo got his racer, his brand new racing bike for Christmas, I, I didn't ask him for a go on it. No, I didn't, no. <laughs> no, I didn't. I wonder why. Mart was my best friend. Mart was my best friend. I thought he was great. But one day, he tried to do for me. I had a hat, a woolly one, and I loved that hat. It was warm and tight. My mum had knitted it, and I wore it everywhere. One day, me and Mart, we were out, and we were standing at a bus stop. And suddenly, he goes and grabs my hat and chucked it over the wall. He thought I was going to go in there and get it out. He thought he'd make me do that because he knew I liked that hat so much I wouldn't be able to stand being without it. He was right. I could hardly bear it. I was really scared I'd never get it back, but I never let on. I never showed it on my face. I just waited. Aren't you going to get your hat? He says. Your hat's gone, he says. Your hat's over the wall. I looked the other way, but I could still feel on my head how he had pulled it off. Your hat's over the wall, he says. I didn't say a thing. Then the bus came round the corner at the end of the road. If I go home without my hat, I'm going to walk through the door and Mum's going to say, where's your hat? And if I say, it's over a wall, she's going to say, well, what's it doing there? And I'm going to say, Mark chucked it over. And she's going to say, well, why didn't you go for it? And what am I going to say then? What am I going to say then? The bus was coming up. Aren't you going over for your hat? There won't be another bus for ages, Mark says. The bus stopped. I got on. Mark got on. The bus moved off. You've lost your hat, Mark says. You've lost your hat, Mark says. Two stops ahead was our stop. Are you going indoors without it, Mart says. I didn't say a thing. The bus stopped. Mart got up and dashed downstairs. He had got off one stop early. I got off when we got to our stop. I went home, walked through the door. Where's your hat, Mum says. Over a wall, I said. Oh, what's it doing there, she says. Mart chucked it over there, I said. But you haven't left it there, have you, she says. Yeah, I said. Well, don't you ever come asking me to make you anything like that again. You make me tired, you do, she says. Later, I was drinking some orange juice. The front doorbell rang. It was Mart. He had the hat in his hand. He handed it to me and went. I shut the front door, put on the hat, walked into the kitchen. Mum looked up. You don't need to wear your hat indoors, do you? She said. I will for a bit, I said. And I did. Nursery. <laughs> My mum says, once I came home from nursery with a sulky look on my face. What's the matter, she said. I said nothing. What's the matter, she said. I said nothing. What's the matter? I had to sit on the naughty chair. Why did you have to sit on the naughty chair? I said nothing. Why did you have to sit on the naughty chair? Because I was being naughty. Yes, yes, I guess that, she said. But what were you doing? I was playing about at singing time. I wasn't singing the right things. Well, what was everyone singing? Bar Bar Black Sheep. And what were you singing? Bar Bar Moo Moo. It would be great if you subscribed, that is, become a subscriber. That way you get to see when I post up new vids. Plastic Bag Tree. The bags are ripe on the plastic bag tree. Bags as far as the eye can see. 
Apples and pears, peaches and plums, the fruit is ripe, it's fantastic. Lemon and lime, bunches of grapes and old bags made of plastic. Shake the branches, gather the crop, it's time to take them down to the shop. Fresh plastic bags on sale today, there's a choice of colour, black or grey. Apples and pears, peaches and plums, the fruit is ripe. It's fantastic. Lemon and lime, bunches of grapes and old bags made of plastic. There's plenty on the shelf. No need to panic. And next year's bags might be organic. The bags are ripe on the plastic bag tree. Bags as far as the eye can see. Bags of bags for you and me. Platform. I'm standing on platform one of Pinner Station at half past four. Mum comes at ten to five. When I wait for her, I watch the signals for the express trains change. I watch the lights change. I watch the trains going dark as they come under the bridge. I'm waiting for my mum. I go and stand by the glass case on the wall where the Christian science people put a Bible for you to read. It's open and there are bits of the page marked that you're supposed to read. I don't understand it. I watch the woman in the sweetie kiosk serving people Mars bars, bars of plain chocolate, packet of chewing gum, Mars bar, Kit Kat, barley sugars. Are you waiting for your mum again? Yes. I go and stand on the shiny floor of the waiting room and look at the big dark benches. There's a boiler in there. They never light it, even in winter. There are big advertisements that I read. One says, Children's shoes have far to go and a boy and a girl are walking away down a long, long road to nowhere with thick woods on both sides of them. I'm not waiting for a train. I'm waiting for my mum. At a quarter two, the flying Scotsman express train comes through. I stand back against the wall. It's the loudest thing I know. The station goes dark. I stop breathing. The coaches move so fast, you can't see people in them. At ten to five, Mum's there. The door's open. She'll be in the second carriage. She always is. Daylight shines from behind her, so I can't see her face. But I know it's her. Mum, I know it's her by her shape and her bag and her walk. Have you been waiting long? No. You could have gone home, you know. You've got a key. I like waiting for you. It's better than being at home on my own. I suppose it is. I point to the children in the big advertisement. Children's shoes have far to go. Where are they going, Mum? I don't know. I hold Mum's hand all the way home. The car trip. Mum says, right you two, this is a long car journey. I'm driving and I can't drive properly if you two are going mad in the back. Do you understand? So we go, OK, Mum, OK. Don't worry about it. And off we go. And then we start the moaning. Can I have a drink? I want some crisps. Can I open my window? He's got my book. Get off me! That's my ear! And Mum tries to be exciting. Look out the window. There's a lamppost. And then we go on. Can I have a sweet? He's sitting on me. Are we nearly there? Don't scratch. You never tell him off. Now he's biting his nails. I want a drink. I want a drink. And Mum tries to be exciting again. Look out the window. There's a tree. And then we go on, my hands are sticky. He's playing with the door handle now. I feel a bit sick, actually. Your nose is all runny. Don't pull my hair. He's punching me, Mum. That's really dangerous, you know. Mum, he's spitting. And Mum says, right, 
I'm stopping the car. I am stopping the car. She stops the car. Now, if you two don't stop it, I'm going to put you out the car and leave you by the side of the road. He started it. I didn't. He started it. I don't care who started it. I can't drive properly if you two go mad in the back. Do you understand? And we go, OK, Mum, OK. Don't worry about it. Can I have a drink? The outing. Right class sex. Right class sex. I'm talking. I'm talking. I want complete quiet. And that includes you, David Alexander. Yes, you. No need to turn around, David. There aren't any other David Alexanders here, are there? Louise, it isn't absolutely necessary for your watch to play us London's Burning just now, is it? Right. As you know, it was our plan to go out today to the Science Museum. Now, I had hoped that it wouldn't be necessary for me to tell you. Yes, you as well, Abdul. You're in class six as well, aren't you? I saw that, Mark. I saw that. Any more, and you'll be out. No trip, nothing. I had hoped that it wouldn't be necessary for me to tell you how to behave when we go on a trip, but, and this is a big but, you haven't heard a word I've said, have you, Donna? This is a big but. I have to tell you how to behave, don't I? Why? Yes, it is because you never listen, but there's another reason, isn't there? Yes, Warren, because of what happened last time. Let's remind ourselves of a few things, shall we? The food, even as I speak. Would you believe it? I can see that Fan has opened her can of drink. I don't I don't believe it. I really don't. Do we have lunch at 9.30 at school? No, we have lunch at 12.15. But Fan, you've already begun yours. If you remember last time, Joanna had eaten all her sandwiches before she even got to school. Lloyd sat on his orange and burst it. And Alfred put one of those little chocolate Swiss rolls in his pocket. And yes, it melted. Yes. So remember, lunch is when? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, lunch is at lunch time, but when? 12.15. Correct. Now, perhaps, I thought, when I got up this morning, I won't have to tell Class 6 about what to do when we get to the station. But then I remembered David's little gang, who decided they wouldn't wait for me to tell them what train to get on. And before we all knew it, David and his little gang were heading for the seaside on their own. Now. When we get to the museum... Of course, you're not listening, are you, Lydia? But then, of course, you didn't listen last time, did you? And then you wondered why you sat on Lloyd's orange after Lloyd had already sat on it once. When we get to the museum, do we run about the corridors? Do we run around screaming? Do we go sliding on the shiny floors? No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we... Thank you, Mervyn. That's enough. I'm very glad you've got jam in your sandwiches, Mervyn. We're all glad you've got jam in your sandwiches, Mervyn, but what's it got to do with sliding on the floor of the Science Museum? Precisely nothing. I'm very sorry, Mervyn, but nobody, nobody at all wants to know about the jam in your sandwiches, Mervyn. Now, when you're ready, when you're quiet, we'll all go. That doesn't mean leaping up in the air, does it, Karen? Louise, why is your watch now playing for he's a jolly good fellow? Yes, I know it could be, she's a jolly good fellow, Zoe, but that isn't what we're talking about now, is it? Mervyn, if I hear about your sandwiches, your jam, or the jam in your sandwiches, if I hear about any of it once more, I shall give them to the ducks. Yes, John, what do you want? I don't know what ducks, John. Any ducks. Right, when there's complete quiet, Complete quiet. You'll find your partners and stand by the door. Oh, no. Not one of those, not another one of those little chocolate Swiss rolls again, Alfred. Surely not. Marcia, you cannot have Charmaine and Donna as your partner because that makes three and three doesn't mean partner, does it? And perhaps you could put your comb in your bag for at least three seconds just giving us enough time to get to the door. Hmm? Right, OK then, Class X, we're off. Why not leave your watch behind, Louise? Hmm? The park. 
Where are you going? Round the park. When are you back? After dark. Won't you be scared? <laughs> what a laugh. A ghost will get you. Don't be daft. I know where it lives. No, you don't. And you'll run away. No, I won't. It got me once. It didn't. Did it? It's all slimy. Tizen. Is it? Where are you going? I'm staying at home. Aren't you going to the park? Not on my own. The Raft Mart and me made a raft for the river. Thick branches crisscrossed and tied with rope. Empty cans on top to help it float. Mart and me would row about on the water. We'd cross to the other side. We'd row downstream, upstream, under the trees, between the fields. We'd be river rovers. The river would be ours. We made the raft at the water's edge. We pushed it out into the shallows. Mart got on. Are you getting on, he said. Uh, not yet, I said. And then whew, it flipped. It flipped right over. Mart was under the raft. The raft was on top of him. He was underwater. I couldn't lift it off him. The criss-cross branches were like a cage holding him down in the river water. His face came up into a space between the branches. He called out. Argh! He went under again into the river. I tried to lift the raft, but he was clinging onto it underneath. I couldn't lift the raft. His face came up into the space again. I could see his hands gripping the branches. He was trying to get air. <gasps> but he couldn't get his mouth up high enough into the space. So his mouth was filling up with river water. Then he went under again. And the space where his face had been was river brown. Mart's brother Tony stepped into the shallows, grabbed the raft and hoisted it up with Mart still clinging to it. Mart choked, <coughs> coughed and spat. He sat on the riverbank, shuddering. His clothes stuck to him like another skin. Mart's mum and dad and my mum and dad had a conference. They decided that there would be no rafting. The rains. In the Jura mountains, it rained and rained and rained. Every day, every night, we lay in our tents and listened to the rain. Rain raining, rain raining, rain raining. The earth was a sponge, the paths were rivers, our sleeping bags were damp. Underneath the tent, it started to smell of old cabbage. Our feet wrinkled. My father got up in the night and shone a torch into the rain and dug a ditch round the tent so that the water would flow away. But the ditch filled up and one night it flowed into the tent. We lay in the dark while the rain rained on and on. Rivulets of rain trickled through the tent. The lightning lit up our faces. The thunder rolled round the mountains. I thought there could be waves of rain and we would float away. When I woke up, the rain had stopped. There was no pattering on the tent roof. There were birds. It was light. Warm in the sleeping bag, cold on our faces, I pulled my hand out of the bag. I touched the tent. The wall was wet and tight. I wondered what was outside on the other side of the wall. I didn't mean to press too hard. Or perhaps I did. The wall of the tent was so wet and so tight that I poked a hole straight through it. I didn't know, but Dad was standing right there and he saw my finger 
burst through. He heard it rip the tent wall. For God's sake, what have you done now? I looked through. He was on the other side, staring in, his eye, big in the hole. Oh, sorry, I said, I, I didn't mean to, honest. Oh, there's dry land out there. The Sky Fugle. There was a man who turned up round our way once, put up a tent in the park he did, put notices all round the streets saying that he was going to put on show a terrifying creature called the Sky Fugle. No one had ever seen this thing before. The show was on for two o'clock the next day. Next day we all turned up to see the fiercest animal in the world. The man took the money at the door. We all poured into the tent with a curtain in front of it. We all sat down and waited. The man went off behind the curtain. Suddenly we all heard a terrible noise. There was an awful yelling and crying. There was the noise of chains rattling and someone shouting. Suddenly the man came running onto the stage in front of the curtains. All his clothes were torn. There was blood on his face and he screamed, quick, get out, get out of here. The Sky Fogel has escaped. We all got up and ran out the door and got away as fast as we could. By the time we got ourselves together, the man had gone. We never saw him again. None of us ever saw our money ever again either. And none of us has ever seen the Sky Fogel. The Talent Show. It was going to be the Talent Show at Barking Primary School. Each of us had an act to do. Mine was play the fool. I would look all tired and giddy, like I was going to faint. I'd fall over in one big heap, face down <laughs> in some paint. My friend Jimmy, the donut jam, was going to juggle cakes. My friend Mary, the biscuit crumb, was going to juggle snakes. So I'm watching everyone else with fizzy at my side. Fizzy is my little dog, and now he was trying to hide. Then Mrs Bones, my teacher, waved. I was ready for the off, when underneath my chair I heard little Fizzy give a cough. In a rush he flew straight at the stage. I wondered what was wrong. Then he grabbed the microphone in his paws and started to sing a song. He sang about a ship's captain, whose name was Benny Brown. And when he went to meet the Queen, his trousers, they fell down. Then Fizzy stopped and took a bow. I promise I tell no lies. You know very well what happened next. Fizzy won first prize. That's what happened at Barking. Now you really know. Each of us had an act to do, but Fizzy stole the show. Where broccoli comes from. Not many people know that broccoli grows in the armpits of very big green men who live in the forest. And brave broccoli cutters go deep into the forests and they creep up on the very big green men. They wait for the very big green men to fall asleep. And the broccoli cutters get out their great big broccoli razors and they shave the armpits of the very big green men. And that's where broccoli comes from. Not many people know that. Just thought I'd let you know. That reminds me of that one that goes, you remind me of a man. What man? A man of power. What power? The power of hoodoo. <laughs> hoodoo? You do. Do what? Remind me of a man. What man? A man of power. What power? The power of who do? Who do? You do. Do what? Remind me of a man. What man? A man of power. What power? The power of who do? Who do? You do. Do what? Remind me of a man. What man? The man of power. What power? The power of who do? Who do? You do. Do what? Remind me of a man. What man? A man of power. The power of who do? You do. You do. Do what? You say next. Say it again. Do what? Do what? 
Remind me of a man. A man of power. The power of who do? You do. Very good. Now let's do it the other way around. You say you remind me of a man. What man? What power? Hmm. That all went, who do you do? Uh, we'll do what power? The power of who do? What power? The power of who do? Who do? Do what? Who do? Do what? Do what man? Speed it up. What man? What power? What power? Who do? Do, do what? You're very good. You clap yourselves. Lovely. Right.